So we're going to be continuing with the second part of chapter 3. Uh, be sure to view the first part also, uh, part A. Uh, you can find that in the link below. Uh, and and uh, please leave comments. Uh, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. And uh, also, if you'd like an exam review for this chapter, please be sure to leave me an email or leave in the comments, and I will try to get that up as, uh, uh, as time permits. Uh, so moving on, in the previous chapter, we looked at diffusion. Uh, we ended off with diffusion. Now we're going to be starting off with uh, active uh, transport, uh, meaning that uh, in order to move things into or out of a cell, energy is needed. Uh, so the two major active uh, membrane transports processes that we're going to be looking at are active transport and vesicular transport. Both of these, they require energy. So that energy being ATP. Uh, without that, uh, without ATP, uh, active transport uh, and vesicular transport, uh, it, they, they, they cannot take place. Uh, so, why do you need active or vesicular transport? Well, the reason you need to, you need these, uh, 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 you need to have active or tra vesicular transport uh, could be for a handful of reasons. Uh, that could be the solute being too large to be able to pass through the protein membrane, uh, the protein, I'm sorry, the protein channel, or the solute uh, is not lipid soluble uh, the other option it could be is that the solute is going against the concentration gradient. Uh, so in all three of these examples that we gave, ATP needs to be a, you need to have ATP in order to move the solute across that plasma membrane. So uh, active uh, transport, you requires uh, carrier proteins that we also call solute pumps. pumps. Uh, these proteins, they'll bind specifically and re reversibly with the substance that's being moved, with the solutes. Uh, some of these uh, uh, proteins, they'll transfer more than one substance, uh, uh, may transfer more than one substance. Um, symporters, they are able to transfer two, substance, two different substances in the same direction. Now, antiporters, they'll transfer one substance into a cell while transporting a different substance out of a cell. Uh, again, in active transfer, both these things, you're moving solutes against their concentration gradient. Again, you're going from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. This is why energy is required, okay? And that energy being, again, is ATP. So the two types of active transport uh, that we're going to be looking at are primary active transport and secondary. Primary active transport, uh, the energy comes directly from hydrolyzing ATP. In the secondary active transport, the energy, it comes indirectly from the ionic gradients that are created by primary transport. So in primary active transport, the energy from uh, uh, the hydrolyzing ATP, it causes a change in the shape of the, of the, the, the transport protein. Uh, the shape changes, it causes the solutes that are bound to that protein to be pumped across that membrane. So examples of this, the most studied example is the sodium potassium pump, uh, but also calcium pumps, hydrogen or proton pumps, they work the same way. So um, as I said, uh, the sodium potassium pump is the most studied. Basically, it's an enzyme that's called sodium potassium ATPase that pumps the sodium out of the cell and the potassium back into the cell. Uh, inside the cell, the potassium concentration is about 10 times higher than, uh, uh, than it is on the outside. And the, the, and the opposite holds true for sodium. Uh, you're gonna find this located in all the plasma membranes, but, uh, but especially you find this uh, in, in active excitable cells like muscle cells and nerve cells. Um, you also find leakage channels that are located in the membranes. Uh, and remember, these leakage ch channels, uh, they work, so they allow uh, sodium and potassium to enter and exit ex the cell. But again, this is happening uh, without any energy. Uh, so the sodium and potassium, they're, they're going through these, uh, these leakage channels down their concentration gradient. But remember, what do you want? You want a higher concentration of potassium inside the cell and a lower uh, concentration of potassium outside. And the opposite, we want the same thing for, uh, the, for sodium, meaning we want sodium to be higher concentrated outside and less uh, on the inside. So because of this, we need to have this, uh, these, uh, uh, these pumps working. So the sodium potassium pumps, they work as an antiporter that pumps sodium out of the cell and then it's pumping the potassium back into the cell against their concentration gradient. And this maintains an electrical chemical gradient which again, it involves both the concentration and electrical charge of these ions. And you need to have this, this is essential 
for muscles and nerves to, uh, to, to, to function properly. Uh, so again, they've, this is just another picture of all the different types of cells that we have in our body. And remember, we said that uh, this pump, the, the sodium pot potassium pump, uh, most important in these two types of cells, muscle cells and the nerve cells. Um, so let's look at uh, this in detail. How does this work? Um, so over here, what, notice what, what you see on, on this diagram. You see a, a sodium concentration that's higher on the outside and then a lower concentration on the inside. And the same thing over here. You see a potassium concentration that's much higher on the outside and much lower on the inside. So what's gonna, what this pump is going to do is this. Remember, we want more on the outside and less sodium on the inside. So as uh, in this, uh, so this is that the enzyme. This is that uh, sodium potassium uh, ATPase pump over here, uh, enzyme here. And uh, as the sodium molecules, which are these yellow uh, spheres, they come and they bind to these sites uh, uh, within that uh, uh, protein molecule. Uh, as this uh, protein comes, uh, I'm sorry, the, the sodium comes, uh, it's going to uh, trigger for, AT, for, for the phosphorylation of ATP, okay? There's an ATP binding site at this point, right over here on the outside. So when this is full with the, when the, uh, the, the sodium, when all the sodium molecules, they end up coming into uh, and, and binding to these sites over here, the ATP is going to phosphorylize. So now you've got this, you've got AD, uh, ADP over here, and you've got the phosphor over here. When this gets phosphorylized, what's going to happen is it's going to cause, cause the, the shape of this protein to change. And then when the, sh the, the protein changes shape, the sodium gets liberated, or gets expelled out of this uh, out of the cell. Now, since the sodium is out of the cell, what's going to happen next is that potassium ions are going to come and sit in the place on the opposite end. Okay, so notice over here, you got uh, different shapes here for potassium, different shape here for the sodium. So now the, 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 the different space over here for, for the potassium. So now as the potassium comes and enters on, on this side, uh, as the second potassium is going to uh, end up coming, once they bind, uh, that binding of the potassium, it's going to cause the release of the phosphor, okay, that, uh, that started this reaction in the first place. So once that phosphor gets released, the sodium is going to get, re uh, the, the potassium will also get released from the, uh, from this, uh, uh, the pump and enters the cell. Uh, so now you have this protein that's back to its original conformation. Next thing that's going to happen is the same thing all over again. Uh, you're going to start getting more uh, uh, sodium ions that are going to come and start binding uh, back to the cell to, to, to continue the process. So uh, in secondary active transport, um, it depends on the ion gradient that was created by the primary active transport system. So what happens is the energy that's stored in the gradient is used indirectly to drive the transport of other solutes. So when you, for example, <clears throat> when you looked at the, the previous uh, example of the sodium uh, and potassium, uh, uh, the sodium potassium ATPase uh, enzyme, um, the low sodium concentration that's maintained inside the cell by the sodium potassium pump, it strengthens the sodium's inward movement okay, by diffusion. Now sodium because of this gradient that, is, that it creates, now sodium is able to, to, to drag other molecules with it as it comes back uh, into the cell uh, through the carrier protein. And usually this protein is a symporter. Uh, that's, again, you find within the membrane. Uh, so some sugars, amino acids, and other ions, they're, tra uh, they're transported this way by secondary uh, active transport. Over here in this diagram, remember in the previous example, we said that when ATP once the sodium uh, uh, ions, they come, uh, this protein, this enzyme over here, ATP will come, it'll phosphorylize this. When this is phosphorylized, uh, the protein chains, uh, to, uh, changes shape and the sodium gets pumped out. At that point, the potassium comes and binds it to that site. And once potassium, uh, both potassium uh, uh, ions, uh, they bind here, it causes the release of that phosphor, uh, that phosphor, uh, phosphorus uh, uh, atom over here. And once that happens, then the, the protein cha changes shape again and the potassium gets released into the uh, cytoplasm. This process is, uh, so this movement, remember, 
uses ATP, okay? And also, it stores the energy by creating a, a, this uh, a steep concentration gradient for this uh, sodium to, to come into the cell. Now, when you look over here, for the secondary active transport, what ends up happening is, as the sodium is diffusing back across this membrane through a, pro uh, through a, a membrane co uh, a prote uh, protein, uh, co-transfer protein, remember, what ends up happening is glucose, uh, it takes a ride with it. Okay? It hops along and takes a ride with it. Uh, so it drives glucose against its concentration gradient into the cell. So uh, next, we're going to be looking at vesicular transport. Now, vesicular transport, this involves transport of large molecules, large particles, um, and fluids uh, across membranes uh, in sacs that we call vesicles. This also requires energy. So again, uh, that energy is usually ATP. Vesicular transport process, they include endocytosis and exocytosis. Now, endocytosis, we're talking about bringing things into the cell. And three different types of ways uh, things are brought into a cell, either through phagocytosis, pinocytosis, or receptor-mediated endocytosis. And the opposite uh, is exocytosis, which transports substances out of the cell. Uh, trans in transcytosis, uh, uh, you're transporting uh, into, across, and then out of a cell. Vesicular tra uh, trafficking, you're transporting from one area uh, uh, of the cell or an organelle into another area of the cell or an organelle. Cytosis. This involves the formation of a, a protein coated vesicle. Uh, usually it involves receptors, therefore, uh, because it involves receptors, it's going to be uh, a very selective process. Uh, the substance that's being pulled into the cell, uh, it has to be able to bind to a unique receptor. Uh, some pathogens, they're capable of, of taking over, or hijacking a receptor uh, and being able to, to, to come inside. Uh, once the vesicle gets pulled, pulled inside the cell, uh, it could uh, either uh, uh, fuse with the lysosome or uh, it could undergo transcytosis. So over here you see what's going on is you have these, uh, uh, whatever this uh, uh, molecules is over here, okay, whatever the substance might be. Um, as it wants, uh, because this wants to come inside the cell and the cell wants it, um, as these guys, they come, they sit on the site, um, the, this, uh, the plasma membrane is going to start invaginating, okay? It forms this pit over here. Um, and what this um, pit sits on, uh, it's coated with, uh, is a, it's a protein coat uh, that's usually something, uh, that, something that's called um, uh, clathrin. Now, once uh, this uh, vesicle is formed in step two, so this protein-coated vesicle, uh, it, after the, the invagination is complete or the pits are complete, uh, you, and the vesicle is formed, the, the vesicle will move in, into the cytoplasm. Once that's done, uh, these molecules over here, these uh, protein molecules, uh, the, the clathrin, um, it'll detach and it'll go back to the surface of the, the, the cell and it'll be reused. So the next thing that happens is this. So now you have an uncoated vesicle. Now this vesicle, it ends up fusing with an endosome. And this endosome, it'll go ahead and further process it or take it to wherever it needs to go or do something else with it. So what ends up happening with the original uh, uh, vesicle that was formed is that it ends up going back and get recycled also. So there's that transport vesicle that, that it came in with. And now it's going to go, because the contents get shifted from here to there to, to the endosome, this transport uh, uh, vesicle will end up going back out and it gets recycled. Now, what's going to happen is this. This endosome can now, uh, it'll get, uh, the, a lysosome will attach to it. It'll fuse with the lysosome. Uh, it may get digested or it'll get delivered uh, to the contents, uh, uh, to the um, uh, plasma membrane on the opposite side. Uh, if it's going to be, uh, again, in the uh, case of transcytosis. Uh, so yeah, this process, just, it just goes through again the steps that we just looked at, uh, that, we, that I just spoke about. So in phagocytosis, this is a type of endocytosis that's referred to, well, pretty much when you break down the word, it's cell eating. So phago is, cell, uh, phago is eating, a cytosol, so cell eating. Uh, what happens here, 
Uh, membrane projections that we call pseudopods, okay, pseudopods again means false feet. They form and flow around a solid, solid particle uh, that's going to be uh, eventually engulfed and they form a vesicle uh, that ends up getting pulled in. This vesicle that's formed is called a phagosome. So uh, in phagocytosis, uh, they're used by, uh, mostly you'll see this very easily in, in the macrophages and other type of white blood cells. And these cells, they move about uh, um, uh, by what we call an amoebid motion, where the cytoplasm, it, uh, it's flowing into this temporary extension that gives us its motility. So when you look at it, it's like, you know, it, it flows, it, it kind of creeps along. Uh, you can, might find some videos on YouTube that, that show this. It's, it's pretty, pretty cool to look at. So <clears throat> this is a picture that's showing you what happens. Uh, so when this, um, when this phagocytic cell, uh, or the cell, uh, when it comes into contact with a debris or a bacteria, whatever it may be, uh, it, uh, it's going to form a sac or an enclosing around it called a phagosome. And it does that by its pseudopods, okay, or its false feed. The phagosome, then it gets uh, combined with lysosomes, lysosome goes and it'll digest or break down whatever is within that vesicle. Uh, now it's called the residual body. So if it was a bacteria or whatever toxin it was, once it's brought into the cell, it remains within that vesicle, so it doesn't harm the machinery of that cell. And by the, by the lysosome combining to it, it'll go and destroy whatever is in there uh, within this vesicle. Uh, within that phagosome. At that point, uh, it'll, uh, usually it'll uh, eject it by exocytosis. Uh, so, pinocytosis is a type of endocytosis that's referred to as cell drinking or fluid phase endocytosis. So, when you look at the word, pino means drinking. Uh, so, uh, cyte, again, that's that cell. Uh, so, cell drinking. The plasma membrane, <clears throat> it enfolds, bringing the extracellular fluid and whatever cellular that's dissolved within the cell. Uh, so it fuses with, with what's we're called the endosome. And we saw an, an example of this um, a few slides ago uh, of what the endosome looks like. Uh, if there's another slide, we'll, we'll go through it again. Uh, but this process, pinocytosis, it happens all the time. It's, it's routine. Um, it's non-selective. And it, it's, it comes in handy because this allows uh, the, the cell to sample what's in the environment, what's in the extracellular fluid. Uh, it's the main way in which nutrients are absor uh, nutrient absorption occurs. Uh, the membrane comp components, they end up getting recycled back to the membrane. So again, if you look over your pinocytosis, uh, whatever this solutes are, again, they have to, they're typically very small particles. They end up uh, coming into this pit. Again, this is a, uh, it's, a, it's lined with the same protein as we uh, discussed earlier, uh, clathrin. And uh, so once this, uh, the, the, the solute comes in, it then it'll pinch off into the vesicle. So with receptor-mediated endocytosis, we're talking about endocytosis and transcytosis of specific molecules. Uh, so many cells, they have receptors that are uh, embedded uh, within the claritin, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the clathrin-coated pits. Uh, these get internalized along with specific molecules that are, uh, that are attached to it. So examples include uh, uh, certain enzymes, enzymes, uh, LDLs, iron, uh, and even hormones like insulin. Uh, uh, unfortunately for us, uh, certain viruses like the flu virus, uh, diphtheria, and other uh, pathogens, they also get taken into the cells this way. Uh, now, one specific type is a uh, cavole. Uh, pretty much this translates into little caves. Uh, they have smaller pits, and they have a different pro a protein code from the clathrin. Um, but still, they're able to capture uh, specific molecules. And usually, uh, for example, this is going to be either fo folic acid or uh, tetanus toxins. And they end up using transcytosis. So if you look over here, uh, what they're showing you is this. Again, you have this, uh, you, got, you got the plasma membrane over here. And uh, uh, on the plasma membrane, you have these specific uh, uh, proteins okay, that are very specific to these receptors. So they're not going to take any, just anything in, but they're just looking for whatever these green balls are. Maybe this is the hormone, and it's a very specific hormone. So only they're, they're only, only going to be able to, 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 to attach themselves uh, to this hormone to be able to bring it into the cell. So now that we've seen how things come into the cell, how do things get out of the cell? Uh, so this is where exocytosis comes in. Uh, so this is where uh, the process on how uh, material, material is ejected from the cell. 
Again, usually uh, it's activated by uh, cell surface signals or changes in the membrane voltage. Uh, substances being ejected, they're usually enclosed within a vesicle. It's a, called a secretory vesicle. Uh, proteins on these vesicles, some of them are called uh, V-snares. Uh, uh, they find and they hook themselves up to target T-snare proteins on the membrane. Uh, so it's like a docking process that triggers exocytosis. Substances that are exocytosis in this way are, uh, they could be hormones, uh, neurotransmitter, mucus, uh, and other cell debris. So over here, when you look at this picture, uh, what are we looking, what you're looking at is, again, exocytosis. So um, the molecule that, that wants to be moved out, they, 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 they first get enclosed uh, within this vesicle, okay, which is called the secretory vesicle. Uh, once that happens, uh, there's also uh, a special protein uh, on, on it. It's like an identity marker. And this is called a V-snare. Uh, so this specific protein that you find, it's, they're called V-snares. So the V stands for a vesicle. So this vesicle uh, uh, um, uh, snare protein is going to drive this uh, sac, this vesicle, uh, secretary vesicle, to its target protein, which is called that T-snare over here. So the, this V-snare and T-snare, they interact. This is how this sac knows where to go to uh, in order to get out. So again, these are very specific. So once you have the V-snare and the T-snare, uh, when they find each other, then they, f uh, they, they fuse together. So it's almost like a corkscrew type of thing, uh, a connection that occurs. Um, at that point, what ends up happening then is that it'll start opening up this vesicle. Uh, so the vesicle and the plasma membrane, uh, they, they, they end up fusing, as you see over here. So at this point, the, the, the first point, you just, you're just having uh, the, the, the two proteins uh, uh, fuse together. In the third step, the plasma membrane also fuses and now you end up getting a pore that forms and the pore opens up. Once that pore opens up, then the contents of that vesicle is be, uh, it's, it's released to the outside of the cell, to the exterior. So this is, this is exocytosis in a nutshell. It's quite uh, it's, uh, simple. And this is just a picture that's showing you, it's a photomicrograph of the secretory vesicle. So you're looking at this, you know, at 100,000 times magnification. So again, you see this vesicle over here, this is the plasma membrane here. You don't see any of the fancy stuff that we saw in the last drawing, but again, what's happening is the same. Whatever contents, content was inside, now it's being uh, uh, let out uh, of the cell. When we're talking about the resting membrane potential, what we're talking about is the difference in charge between the outside of a cell, uh, of the plasma membrane, and the inside of the plasma membrane. Typically, a cell is going to be much more, uh, uh, it's going to be electronegative on the inside than on the outside. And that range can go anywhere from uh, minus 50 to minus 100 millivolt. Uh, the average nerve cell, for example, is about roughly minus 70 uh, millivolts. Um, be sure you go and you look at this animation that, uh, that you can find uh, either online or if you're, uh, the book came with the disc, be sure to look at that, the ENP flicks. Uh, that'll help uh, better explain this and uh, demonstrate this uh, concept also to you. So voltage is electrical potential energy that results from the separation of positively charged particles. And cells that have a charge are said to be polarized. Uh, so again, voltage occurs only at the membrane surfaces. Uh, the remainder of the cell, the extracellular fluid, they're neutral. Uh, so again, that the, the, only the difference occurs at the membrane surface. And like I said earlier, uh, the range is anywhere from minus 50 volts to, uh, no, to uh, minus 100 megavolts. Um, so potassium is a key player in the resting membrane potential. So as potassium diffuses out of a cell through those potassium leakage channels, uh, remember, it's going down its concentration gradient. Because remember what we said earlier on, the concentration of potassium is much, 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 it's 10 times higher inside the cell than it is outside. And then the converse is true for uh, sodium. A lot more sodium outside of the cell than in, in, inside. As the, so the potassium is going out. However, however the negatively charged uh, proteins, they're not able to leave. So because of that, the cytoplasmic side of the cell, uh, it ends up being much more negative. Potassium ends up getting pulled back in 
uh, by the more negative interior because of this electrical gradient that's created. So when the drive for potassium to leave is balanced by its drive to stay, then we've established the resting membrane potential. Now, the majority of the cells, they have a resting membrane potential of around negative 90 uh, millivolts. Uh, so remember what the range was, anywhere from minus 50 to uh, minus 100. Nerve cells, your neural lines are about roughly minus 70. Uh, so electrical chemical gradient of potassium, it sets the resting membrane potential. Many cells, uh, sodium also affects the rem resting membrane potential. So sodium is also attracted to the inside of the cell because of uh, the negative charge. Now, if sodium enters a cell, it could bring the resting uh, membrane potential up to about minus 70 uh, millivolts. And this is what happens in the case of the neuron, your nerve cell. So membrane is much more permeable to potassium than, is, than, uh, than sodium. So potassium is a main influencer for the resting membrane potential. So potassium plays a huge role. Uh, chloride ions, uh, they don't influence the resting uh, membrane potential because its concentration and electrogradients they're exactly balanced. And that happens because of the sodium that's outside. So if you look over here in this diagram, uh, let's follow uh, the, 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 the steps over here. One, two, three. Let's look over here. Uh, you have a lot of potassium ions over here. And as these potassium ions, as they exit, uh, or in other words, they're diffusing down their concentration gradient uh, out of the cell by these uh, uh, leakage channels, uh, this loss of the potassium, it creates a negative charge on the inner side of the plasma membrane. Now, at the same time, remember, you're getting potassium that's also moving into the cell. And they're moving in because they're att attracted to this negative uh, uh, charge uh, uh, on the inside of this plasma membrane. So, that's number two. So, a negative membrane potential, again, of roughly 90 um, uh, millivolts, is what gets established when the movement of potassium going out of the cell equals the movement of uh, potassium uh, uh, ions moving into the cell. The resting membrane potential is maintained through the actions of the sodium and potassium pumps. Uh, these are continuously ejecting. For every three sodium ions uh, out of the cell, they end up bringing back two potassium uh, back inside the cell. So this steady state is maintained because the rate of the active uh, pumping of the sodium outside the cell it equals the rate of the sodium that's diffusing back into the cell. So neurons and muscle cells, they get ups uh, upset, uh, as, as we say, uh, by the steady uh, uh, state of, uh, uh, of the resting membrane potential. And what they end up doing is they uh, end up opening these gated sodium and, and potassium channels. And in doing so, they get, they, this is how they get activated. Interact with their environment by responding di uh, by responding either directly to other cells or indirectly to other cells. Now, either way, uh, the way that these interactions uh, occur is that they involve glycocalyx. Now, the two most uh, uh, the, the two types of uh, glycocalyx that we we'll, that we are very well aware of uh, and understand are cell adhesion molecules and the plasma membrane receptors. So we're going to stop at this point uh, with uh, part B for uh, chapter 3. Uh, there's one more part left, part C. Uh, so be sure to look out for that when that gets posted. Uh, that should be up within the next 24 hours. Uh, also, if you haven't seen the first part of this uh, uh, series, be sure to look in the link below to find uh, chapter, the chapter 1. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the part A for uh, chapter 3. Uh, as always, if you like this, please give it a thumbs up and share with your friends. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave it in the comments below or you can email me directly. Uh, thank you for watching.